Chapter 5 The feast of the new yam was approaching, and Amalfia was in a festival mood. It was an occasion for giving thanks to Ani, the earth goddess, and the source of all fertility. Ani played a greater part in the life of the people than any other deity. She was the ultimate judge of morality and conduct, and what was more, she was in close communion with the departed fathers of the clan, whose bodies had been committed to the earth. The Feast of the New Yam was held every year before the harvest began, to honor the earth goddess and the ancestral spirits of the clan. New yams could not be eaten until some had first been offered to these powers. Men and women, young and old, looked forward to the New Yam Festival because it began the season of plenty, the New Year. On the last night before the festival, yams of the old year were all disposed of by those who still had them. The new year must begin with tasty, fresh yams, and not, all, not the shriveled and fibrous crop of the previous year. All cooking pots, calabashes, and wooden bowls were thoroughly washed, especially the wooden mortar in which the yam was pounded. Yam fufu and vegetable soup was the chief food in the celebration. So much of it was cooked that no matter how heavily the family ate or how many friends and relatives they invited from neighboring villages, there was always a large quantity of food left over at the end of the day. The story was always told of a wealthy man who sat before his guests at a mound of fufu so high that those who sat on one side could not see what was happening on the other. And it was not until late in the evening that one of them saw for the first time his in-law who had arrived during the course of the meal and had fallen to the opposite side and had fallen to on the opposite side. It was only then that they exchanged greetings and shook hands over what was left of the food. The New Yam Festival was thus an occasion for joy throughout Umorphia, and every man whose arm was strong, as the Igbo people say, was expected to invite large numbers of guests from far and wide. Okonkwo always asked his wives' relations, and since he now had three wives, his guests would make a fairly big crowd. But somehow Okonkwo could never become as enthusiastic over feasts as most people. He was a good eater, and he could drink one or two fairly big gourds of palm wine. But he was always uncomfortable, sitting around for days, waiting for a feast or getting over it. He would be, he would be very much happier working on his farm. The festival was now only three days away. Aconquo's wives had scrubbed the walls and the huts with red earth until they reflected light. They had then drawn patterns on them in white, yellow, and dark green. They then set about painting themselves with cam wood and drawing beautiful black patterns on their stomachs and their, on their backs. The children were also decorated, especially their hair, which was shaved in beautiful patterns. The three women talked excitedly about the relations who had been invited, and the children reveled in the thought of being spoiled by these visitors from the motherland. Ikimafuna was equally excited. The New Yam Festival seemed to him to be a much bigger event here than in his own village, a place which was already becoming remote and vague in his imagination. And then the storm burst. A Conquo, who had been walking about aimlessly in his compound in suppressed anger, suddenly found an outlet. Who killed this banana tree? he asked. A hush fell on the compound immediately. Who killed this tree? Are all of you deaf and dumb? As a matter of fact, the tree was very much alive. Akonkwo's second wife had merely cut a few leaves off of it to wrap some food, and she said so. Without further argument, Akonkwo gave her a sound beating and left her and her only daughter weeping. Neither of the other wives dared to interfere beyond an occasional and tentative, It is enough, Akonkwo, pleading from a reasonable distance. His anger thus satisfied, Aconqua decided to go out hunting. He had an old rusty gun made by a clever blacksmith who had come to live in Amorphia long ago. But although Aconqua was a great man whose prowess was universally acknowledged, he was not a hunter. In fact, he had not killed a rat with his gun. And so when he called Akimafuna to fetch his gun, 
The wife who had just been beaten murmured something about guns that never shot. Unfortunately for her, Okonkwo heard it and ran, and ran madly into his room for the loaded gun, ran out again and aimed at her as she clambered over the dwarf wall of the barn. He pressed the trigger and there was a loud report accompanied by the wail of his wives and children. He threw down the gun and jumped into the barn. And there lay the woman, very much shaken and frightened, but quite unhurt. He heaved a heavy sigh and went away with the gun. In spite of this incident, the New Yam Festival was celebrated with great joy in Aconquo's household. Early that morning, as he offered a sacrifice of new yam and palm oil to his ancestors, he asked them to protect him, his children, and their mothers in the new year. As the day wore on, his, his in-laws arrived from the three surrounding villages and each party brought with him with them a huge pot of palm wine. And there was eating and drinking till night when Aconquo's in-laws began to leave for their homes. The second day of the new year was the day of the great wrestling match between Aconquo's village and their neighbors. It was difficult to say which the people enjoyed more, the feasting and fellowship of the first day or the wrestling contest of the second. But there was one woman who had no doubt whatever in her mind. She was Aconquo's second wife, Equefi, whom he, he nearly shot. There was no festival in all the seasons of the year which gave her as much pleasure as the wrestling match. Many years ago, when she was the village beauty, Aconqua had won her heart by throwing the cat in the greatest contest within living memory. She did not marry him then because he was too poor to pay her bride price. But a few years later, she ran away from her husband and came to live with Aconquo. All this happened many years ago. Now Aquefi was a woman of 45 who had suffered a great deal in her time, but her love of wrestling contests was still as strong as it was 30 years ago. It was not yet noon on the second day of the New Yam Festival. Equefi and her only daughter, Azinma, sat near the fireplace, waiting for the water in the pot to boil. The fowl Equefi had just killed was in the wooden mortar. The water began to boil, and in one deft movement, she lifted the pot from the fire and poured the boiling water over the fowl. She put back the empty pot on the circular pad in the corner and was and looked at her palms, which were black with soot. Ezinma was always surprised that her mother could lift a pot from the fire with her bare hands. Equefi, she said, is it true that when people are grown up, fire does not burn them? Ezinma, unlike most children, called her mother by her name. Yes, replied Equefi, too busy to argue. Her daughter was only 10 years old, but she was wiser than her years. But Noye's mother dropped her pot of hot soup the other day, and it broke on the floor. Equefi turned the hen over in the mortar and began to pluck the feathers. Equefi, said Azima, who had joined in plucking the feathers, my eyelid is twitching. It means you're going to cry, said her mother. No, Azima said, it is this eyelid, the top one. That means you will see something. What will I see? She asked. How can I know? Equefi wanted her to work it out herself. Oh, ho, said Azima at last. I know what it is. The wrestling match. At last the hen was plucked clean. Equefi tried to pull out the horny beak, but it was too hard. She turned round on her low stool and put the beak in the fire for a few moments. She pulled again and it came off. Equefi! A voice called from one of the other huts. It was Noye's mother, Aconquo's first wife. Is that me? Equefi called back. That was the way people answered calls from outside. They never said yes for fear it might be an evil spirit calling. Will you give Azima some fire to bring to me? Her own children and Akimafuna had gone to the stream. Equefi put a few live coals into a piece of broken pot, and Azinma carried it across the clean-swept compound to Noye's mother. Thank you, Inma, she said. She was peeling new yams, and in a basket beside her were green vegetables and beans. 
Let me make the fire for you, Azima offered. Thank you, Azigbo, she said. She often called her Azigbo, which means the good one. Azima went outside and brought some sticks from the huge bundle of firewood. She brought them into she brought them into little pe- broke them into little pieces across the sole of her foot and began to build a fire, blowing it with her breath. You will blow your eyes out, said Noye's mother, looking up from the yams she was peeling. Use the fan. She stood up and pulled out the fan, which was fastened into one of the rafters. As soon as she got up, the troublesome nanny goat, which had been dutifully eating yam peelings, dug her teeth into the real thing and scooped out two mouthfuls and fled from the hut to chew the cud in the goat shed. Noye's mother swore at her and settled down again to her peeling. Azima's fa- fire was now setting up thick clouds of smoke. She went on fanning until it burst into flames. Noye's mother thanked her, and she went back to her mother's hut. Just then, the distant beating of drums began to reach them. It came from the direction of the Ilo, the village playground. Every village had its own Ilo, which was as old as the village itself, and where all the great ceremonies and dances took place. The drums beat the unmistakable wrestling dance, quick, light, and gay, and it came floating on the wind. Aconqua cleared his throat and moved his feet to the beat of the drums. It filled him with fire, as it always had, as it had always done from his youth. He trembled with the desire to conquer and subdue. It was like the desire for woman. We shall be late for the wrestling, said Azima to her mother. They will not begin until the sun goes down. But they are beating the drums. Yes, the drums begin at noon, but the wrestling waits until the sun begins to sink. Go and see if your father has brought out yams for the afternoon. He has. Noye's mother is already cooking. Go and bring our own then. We must cook cook quickly or we shall be late for the wrestling. Azima ran in the direction of the barn and brought back two yams from the dwarf wall. Equeffy peeled the yams quickly. The troublesome nanny goat sniffed about, eating the peelings. She cut the yams into small pieces and began to prepare a pottage using some of the chicken. At that moment, they heard someone crying at just outside their compound. It was very much like Obia Jelly, Noyer's sister. Is that not Obia Jelly weeping? Equeffy called across the yard to Noyer's mother. Yes, she replied. She must have broken her water pot. The weeping was now quite close, and soon the children filed in, carrying on their heads various sizes of pots suitable to their years. Akimafuna came first with the biggest pot, close, closely followed by Noye and his two younger brothers. Obiageli, Obiageli brought up the rear, her face streaming with tears. In her hand was the cloth pad on which the pot should have rested on her head. What happened? Her mother asked, and Nobia Geli told her mournful story. Her mother consoled her and promised to buy her another pot. Noye's younger brother, brothers were all about to tell their mother the true story of the accident when Akimafuna looked at them sternly, and they held their peace. The fact was that Obia Geli had been making inyanga with her pot. She had balanced it on her head, folded her arms in front of her, and began to sway her waist like a grown-up young lady. When the pot fell down and broke, she burst out laughing. She only began to weep when they got near the Iroko tree outside their compound. The drums were still beating, the persistent and unchanging. Their sound was no longer a separate thing from the living village. It was the pulsation of its heart. It throbbed in the air, in the sunshine, and even in the trees, and filled the village with excitement. Equeffi ladled her husband's share of the pottage into the bowl and covered it. Azima took it to him in his obi. Okonkwa was sitting on a goat skin, already eating his first wife's meal. Obiageli, who had brought it from her mother's hut, sat on the floor waiting for him to finish. Azima placed her, mo- her mother's dish before him and sat with Obiageli. Sit like a woman, Akankwo shouted at her. 
as Zidma brought her two legs together and stretched them in front of her. Father, will you go see the wrestling? Azima asked after a suitable interval. Yes, he answered. Will you go? Yes. And after a pause, she said, Can I bring your chair for you? No, that's a boy's job. Akanko was specially fond of Azima. She looked very much like her mother, who was once the village beauty, but his fondness only showed on very rare occasions. Obi Ageli broke her pot today, Azima said. Yes, she has told me about it, Akanko said between mouthfuls. Father, said Obi Ageli, people should not talk when they are eating, or Pepper may go down the wrong way. That is very true. Do you hear that, Azima? You are older than Obi Ageli, but she has more sense. He uncovered his second wife's dish and began to eat from it. Obi Ageli took the first dish and returned to returned to her mother's hut, and then Inkechi came in, bringing the third dish. Inkechi was the daughter of Akankwa's third wife. In the distance, the drums continued to beat.